What's up, everybody? This is Albert, pronouns he, him, his, and we are back with another video for my um, series of books on um, Black history, Black culture, and anything that is against um, um, oppression and uh, status quo. So this book that we're going to be reading today is called Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia by Sabrina Strings. So this is, um, so a little background about Sabrina Strings. She is a professor at the University of California, Irvine, Irvin, I don't know how it's pronounced, but yeah, but she's um, a professor that... Um, does a lot of research involving race, sexuality, gender, um, and especially um, um, human body and how the body is conditioned to do certain things. So some a lot of her research, um, it led into um, her work regarding how the history of weight and how people are using weight as a form of social control. So it led to her um, getting into the history of um, how certain bodies are treated in, into in, in certain social distinctions and um, class hierarchies. So she learned um, how, um, how, how we how society has treated different sort kinds of bodies over time so she got into fat phobia and how there's anti-blackness that coincided with how we treated um people that are fat so this is a interesting uh this is an eye opening this is something that I've this is a fairly new book. This was um, released in 2019, and I think this is probably like the mo the most um, known um, piece of work that delves into um, anti fatness because it goes into like the history of weight, the history of how it coincided with colonization, and etc. And it's it, like I would say this probably wouldn't have been released in like 10 years ago regarding how people talk about weight and stuff like that. So that's in, so that's um, what um, draw my attention to it and how she sees it as um, something that white supremacy uses in order to contribute to the oppression of um, black people and other oppressed peoples. So let's get into it. So the first... We're first going to start into the introduction titled The Original Epidemic. And it started out talking about how um, the the discourse on the weight of American women um, has influenced how we look at hunger and desirability. So, of course, the ideal is to be a thin person to shed all the excess weight and everything and how that contributes to um, um, Eurocentric standards of beauty and um, how um, when it comes to like magazines, um, beauty pageants, um, um, even Hollywood films, how, um, how specifically, um, people, specifically women, um, how to navigate, um, certain industries and in, in to fit a certain body type in order to get, um, an opportunity. So there's, um, a uh, anti-fat bias that is go that um she that um spring spring strings um notice that is going on in Western history. So there's an article in the New York Times called "Actually Starving" about um about it says here thousands of men and women in New York and throughout the land are starving although they have plenty of money to buy the best of food. These startling words were recently ustered by a prominent physician whose residence situated in one of the best parts of Fifth Avenue is daily thronged with fashion, fashion, fashionable patients. He made the above remarkable statement to a reporter in the course of an in interview. I say, he, he continued, that they are starving to death, slowly but surely. Like, people are really, um, they rather, they rather die than be fat because they because the way we treat the way society treats on um, fat people it's dehumanizing it's it's um 
it's just the fact that people are willing to get surgeries and do all these these things to their body to not get fat and they they can risk being and risk dying over it so that's a phenomenon that um she noticed and i think that's it for that part and then she went into like um a breakdown of like how each chapter is broken which we'll get into so the first um so part one is called the beauty of the robust so chapter so chapter one titled being venus so it went into how during the the renaissance era so for those who don't know who the renaissance era that's where english philosophers artists and all that that leonardo da vinci Raphael, uh, michelangelo all them um artists um there they went into they get into this creative um intellectual space to um find out um to just analyze the human experience and a lot of those involved um certain body types a lot of those involve what's considered beautiful so we there's a painting that um is um note that was um drawn in 1521 um and this is a portrait of this black woman named katharina which let me show you so this is katharina i don't know if that's pronounced but she's a it's titled portrait of an african woman katharina by albrecht durer so it shows like how um these are these are uh, there was a time where voluptuous and thick women were and plump women were appreciated during the renaissance era and it it goes into like so many different types of of why that's seen as desirable so there's so there's certain standards going on during the Renaissance and it has a emphasis on proportionality. So there's a um that type of fatness is beautiful, that type of thickness is beautiful. So that's it goes into this aesthetic hierarchy that um certain artists were going for. And there's a lot of paintings of different women. There are a lot of um there are a lot of um nude portraits too so there are a lot of um uh, discussions revolving beauty standards and how um certain bodies can be perceived and it wasn't like a focus on weight back then so it was before what the we talk about weight the way we do now because this is before colonization and they have a they even have like this portrait of what is considered a normal woman and i don't know if youtube might censor me because it's it's not like a very graphic um image that is shown but it's an image of a quote unquote normal woman and this normal woman is not the, the quote unquote normal woman that we um talk about today this is actually a um, fat woman a very thick woman that is um that has been designed and seen as um, desirable. So that's, so it goes, and it's not just fat women. There are portraits of thin women. There was portraits of all types of body sizes that were appreciated and seen, but noted these are all white women, mainly. These are mainly white women that were portrayed because this is the Renaissance. This is where, where um the english were um going into um what's considered beautiful so it's a lot of white women that are portrayed and yeah um Raphael's La Fonarina um Alessandro de Medici's um all these types of artists so it's interesting how we go into different um how we get into um um, how we talk about bodies um, compared to then and there's um, there's um, then it gets into um, portraits of black women so right here there's a painting of um, um, Diana and Acteon so this is an artist by name of Titian 
I think that's how do you, how do you pr pronounce it? So it says here, black women also appeared in Titian's vast portfolio. Titian pulled these women into the iconography of proportionate and fleshy feminine beauties, making them the aesthetic equals of European women. This was the case in what is considered one of the artist's greatest works, Diana and Actaeon. In this 1559 painting, Titan reimagines a tale from the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphoses. In the myth, Actaeon, a young hunter fresh from the day's kill, wanders aimlessly through the woods with his hunting dogs. He happens upon the sacred cave of the goddess and virgin huntress Diana. So Diana is a um a is what we what is uh, is implied is to be a black woman while she is bathing. His presence sparks a flurry of activity as nymphs beat their breasts, warning Diana of Actaeon's violent entry into their hallowed dwelling. Suspicious of his intent and believing that he has penetrated the cave for the express purpose of seeing her undress, Diana curses him by turning him into a deer. Later, his own dogs devour him, ensuring that he will tell no one what he saw. So that gets into um, this um, uh, mythological sense of how of um, certain types of bodies are. It gets into uh, curses. Um, it's making me think about the curse of Ham and and um, was justifying white supremacy as we know it today. So Diana is known as someone who curses. Um, so that's interesting. One of the few black women um, portraits that are talking about um, a woman putting a curse on a on a white man. So I can see how it's like fear mongering or something. And then there is um, Judith with the head of Holofernes. So there, so th there's an image of um, Judith from the Bible. And um, her and her and then there's um, um, the head of Holofernes, who I think I forgot. I think it was um, um, Judith was a yeah. Judith was a widow, and she uses her charms to get this man. And you see this black woman servant, and I think the black woman servant was like her accomplice. So there were black women that were starting to be in these portraits that are. Um, stereotypically subservient roles. So it's it's getting into um, these um, ideals on what black women um, are perceived perceived to be. And here's another image of um, of a black woman in the Renaissance. So there's a portrait of a Moorish woman. So. And then there's um, the African Venus. So in, uh, here's the image of the African Venus. So the Venus is is like the the beauty archetype and for um, voluptuous woman. So and here um, in 16th century Italian masterworks, low status black women have been prized for their figures. But by the turn of the 17th century, black women were shifting from the aesthetic counterparts of European women to their aesthetic counterpoints, their novelty having worn off in areas where the slave trade had been going off going on the longest, black women's figures too were being described as inferior. In a new proto-racist order, black women were increasingly deemed little, low, and foul. The plump aesthetic became more and more frequently associated with white women, which was interesting because the tides have turned once the transatlantic uh, the tables have turned when the tr transatlantic slave trade happened. And out and here, at the same time in England, a country that arrived relatively late to the transatlantic slave trade, a new trend was taking off among refined men, thinness. In English high society, philosophers had started to rethink the meaning of the fat male body. Voluptuousness in women was all well and good. Women were but the objects of men's fancies. Fatness in men signaled the lack of self-control or dimness. For elite men, slenderness became bodily proof of rationality in intelligence intelligence so it's this idea that fat people are not intelligent and thin are equates to intelligence so it gets into eugenics too so because white people were considered superior and intelligent while people of other races are not and then that was the end for um 
chapter one. Chapter two was titled Plump Women and Thin Fine Men. So she, there was a there was a shift in beauty from the high renaissance to the African slave trade. Let me get to that page. Yeah, so right here, the slave trade was fundamental to the development of the burgeoning culture of taste. Within this culture, the objectification of black bodies and labor through the slave trade turned black people themselves into the shadow figures of modernity, appearing to exist outside of and in opposition to it. Black people thus increasingly came to represent difference or a perverse primitivity and backwardness, a polemical otherness. Black people became, in other words, aesthetic counterpoints within the budding culture of taste. This had a visible impact on the representations of black women, given the centrality of appearance to the assessment of a woman's worth. Once accorded a measure of dignity and desirability, black women were progressively represented as small, low, and foul. White women dominated the landscape of statuesque beauties. So that gets into Eurocentric standards of beauty. Um, so, because um, not only it got because of the slave trade, but it was also because of um, the massive sugar consumption that was going on during this period. And um, once there was a mass production of sugar, elite white people be were, be, were starting to gain weight, and um, they started to notice that their body changes they pay that like paid a close attention to ha close attention to it and all of the, a lot of that sugar came from africa of course so that's um that's made them think like africans don't know how to control themselves so they started to become fat and they also don't know how to be civilized so that's why they started the transatlantic slave trade and used them for free labor and all that. So that's how. That, so you literally anti fatness became like essential to how the transatlantic slave trade came to be, by that by that um, lack of logic, and and then they got into how the term obesity. Um, um came to term so it's on page 57 let me see yeah so right here the mind-boggling profits the english reap from sugar plantations were one obvious benefit of this trade another one's a widespread availability of a commodity once deemed so rare and interesting that it was dubbed white gold in 1660, England imported 1,200 barrels of sugar from Barbados and other key West Indian holdings. By 1700, that amount had jumped to 50,000 barrels. And right here, in 1620, for example, the Oxford-trained English physician Tobias Venner lamented the rising rates of corpulence among the English, so overeating, and um, excess weight, using for the first time the word obesus to describe excess fat. Veneer argued that obesity had adverse health consequences. He offered a treatment to make slender such pot bodies as are too gross. So, so, and um, they said that sh the the overconsumption of sugar leads to this illness named called gout. So they, the English um, scientists at the time were trying to encourage people to be careful what they eat. Um, uh, don't, um, they tried to use weight as a form of social control to um, uh, get people to, to have this preservation for the Anglo-Saxon Protestant race. So that is that's what a lot of the um, the medical um racism stems from too. So it's um uh, more about eugenics and preserving the white race and the black people are going to die off anyway. So because because of um medical racism. So that's why there's a lot more care to white patients in um hospitals and um the in um the fertility rates are increasing for um, for um white people compared to um black people because of the doc because of white doctors they tend to be more ne negligent in their practices among black women considering the gynecology is as men originated from um how um, doctors treated black slave women and a lot of the babies um um 
were um, taken advantage of. And then... And then um, the the way they went about um, controlling people's weight, that's when diet culture um, started to take form. And diet culture not only originated from uh, what is considered intelligent, but also from Protest the Protestant Reform Re Reformation movements. And they used that to make this caste system development in the Western world. So... I think that was it. So that was um so that that is um showing why um uh plump women were uh, there was a lot of focus on how to control women. It was because of um how there's a con correlation between fatness and infant mortality rates and there's a correlation between um how women are eating and how they carry babies because they want to preserve the anglo-saxon protestant race and and it's not because really it's not really health at all it's really about aesthetics it's really about um what is considered um desirable it's not about health at all it's under the guise of health the the thing is there's no logical science behind that they just see they just go by well, over time um uh, what's considered beautiful and when they found that sugar is um a lot of sugar was in Africa they start and they considered Africans to be primitive and savages that they tried to uh, the ideals of what is con of what is considered beautiful has shifted from like any types of bodies plump voluptuous fat and thick and all of that to thinness is the ideal and the standard that should be so that's how we got into um um how we are now so then there's part two which is titled race weight god and country and then we got to chapter three which is titled the rise of the big black woman so um race science was um um i don't know i don't know if this was like the person who invented race science but um this person named francois bernier um was a quote-unquote intellectual of the time he was a known scientist and he started to develop these um theories on the conceptualization conceptualization of race and um he i don't think he didn't coin the term race but we we talk about race today because of how this guy thinks <laughs> and then it was um also sh also um um promoted during the french slave trade so let me get to page 70 to 71 Yeah, so in 1684, Bernier sketched out his theory in a letter to Madame de la Sablier that bore the rather grand title, A New Division of the Earth. In this um, three-page manifesto, he explained his rationale for developing this new model of humankind. Hitherto, geographers have divided the Earth only into different countries or regions therein, but my own observations have given me the idea of dividing it another way. The problem with the traditional geographic dissection of the globe, he concluded, was that it failed to acknowledge the tremendous physical distinctions found between peoples living in diverse parts of the world. In Bernier's estimation, men are almost all distinct from one another as far as the external form of their bodies is concerned, especially their faces, according to the different areas of the world they live in. And while globe-trotting men such as himself could often distinguish unerringly one nation from another, he nevertheless found that common unities of physical form across national boundaries warranted a new system for classifying mankind, a system he called types of race. So that's a, how we got um, these physical distinct distinctions because of um, our, the color of our skin. And 
He also said, as noted, Bernier had not coined the term race, but with his new division of the earth, he had fundamentally changed what it meant in his reimagination of the term. Race did not apply only to the lowly Jewish or Moorish objects of the crown or to the highborns within the kingdom. Rather, all of the world's peoples had a race, one that could be identified both by where they lived and their external physical features. So that's how um, anthropologists and um um, travelers went into observe different areas of the world. They talk about the, the, the distinguished characteristics of the inhabitants of that area. So once they got to Africa, they made the assessments that they made. And curiously, despite Brenier's certainty that everyone had a physically identifiable race, he nonetheless wavered on how many races there were in all, stating that there were four or five. So notice he categorized these, these types of races based on a rating scale. So the first race included people from diff three different continents compromising the whole of Europe in general, except for part of Muscovy, Africa, namely that between the kingdoms of Fez and Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli, and likewise a large part of Asia. Into the second race, he placed nearly the entire continent of Africa, excluding the northern coastal areas already ascribed to the first race. The third race covering the nations of China, Japan, and much of East Asia. So skin color was a major consideration used to sort people into racial groups. So he had white people as the first race, like they're the first race. It's because he, the, they're the first people he recognized. That's why they're titled the first race, the superior and um, race. So he got into that. And then Bernier affirms racial differences and beauty by claiming that, like physical features in general, the beauty of women is no less different, differentiated. Nevertheless, he certifies black women's attractiveness by using the existing standard for white women. Acclean nose, small mouth, coral lips, ivory teeth, large bright eyes, gentle features. In this way, the black women who were good looking could lay claim to the title only because of their similarity to the neoclassical ideal of Venus. Indeed, these women appear to be beating the Venus at her own game. Although Bernier was influenced by the trail of black denigration left by the Dutch and the English, he did not let their respective perspective of black women contradict what he had seen with his own eyes. So that's how we got into not just the Venus, but the hot and tight re Venus. So, um, the hot and tight Venus is um, race specific. So, the Venus is the Renaissance um, beauty, and then the hot and tight Venus is is um, a specific desirable um, black woman. So, um. Yeah, so then it went to, um, got into some of the observations of a person who went to Africa, Comde Buffon. Um, he distinguished the people first by their race and then by their size. And then there's this um, concerns of gluttony, which I think is one of the seven sins. <laughs> yeah, so gluttony is um, overeating, so eating more than you're supposed you're supposedly supposed to eat. So um, that is how religion got into it, and how it um, um, the um, um, made Africans um feel um uh irresponsible of of have irresponsible of their bodies. So it's leads into how um um corpulence, overeating and and overeating were criticized in their cultures and it never take into consideration the climate of the area, um the the way that people eat in that area, the bot the way they had to move with their bodies, because knowing that body all bodies are different. Some people just eat more than others. And some people just have probably have eating disorders. So that's um it didn't take in consideration of that. So according to Buffin, the plumpness of black Africans was evidence of their ease of circumstance and their idleness. 
The land inhabited by the Negroes he claimed were rich, was rich, as abounding in pasturage in mil Millet and in trees always green. For this reason, black Africans were able to stay well nourished with little or no effort, which made them well fed, but also simple and stupid. Buffon's linking of corpulence to laziness and slow wittedness was in harmony with the ideas of the thin, fine, serious intellectuals of England of a century earlier, as well as should have been. Upon departing for England, Buffon found himself well received by the English intelligence intelligentsia. While there, he was elected a member of the Royal Society, one of Europe's first national scientific societies whose founders included none other than the Wayfish Cambridge Platonist Robert Boyle. So that's how we got into equating black fatness to blackness and we got into colonialism and how black people and fat people are treated very similar and there was a court they said there was a correlation of fatness to melanin and then it got into the story of sarah bartman who um it was a heartbreaking story so if y'all know about the story of sarah bartman i'll put it i'll put um i think you, you could just google you could just youtube sarah bartman um she was um a black woman who is known for her um size she was um she was a fat woman that was um going around the world doing shows and a lot of those shows um involved having sex with men she was um she was a person that was fetishized like she she got her living and her notoriety based on her size and um her um her um sexuality so it got into like um black people are not only irresponsible with they're irresponsible with their body in general but not only are they uncivilized but they are hypersexualized so it got into um um it, that's how we led into the story of sarah bartman um uh, uh, all of these men were um analyzing her um all these white men they did stuff with did stuff to her without her consent it was very violent what was done to her it's kind of similar to henrietta lax if y'all know about the story of her um and then um there was there was this um uh guy i forgot his name I think it was Robert Boyle that um that um met Sarah Bartman, but he asked her if he can like do some studies on her and they're they're very intense studies and she said no, she doesn't want to do all that stuff, but then she died and then this person went along with the studies without her con even knowing that she wouldn't have consented to it. So that gets into um um, the way we take away fat people's autonomy and their agency in society. So it's a lot of those those a lot of those practices are common is the way that black people were treated during history. So um yeah, so that's good into that. And then um spring Sabrina String said here, it is not surprising that the French and British were at the helm of 18th century racial scientific discourse marking black people as glutinous. The growing codification of black people as greedy eaters developed against the backdrop of the accelerating slave trade among these two colonial powers of the 18th century. This, together with the exigencies of reason, wealth, self-management in the context of the high enlightenment, transformed the act of eating from personal to political. Indulging in food, once deemed by philosophers to be a low bro predilection of slow-witted persons, became evidence of actual low breeding. It's bespoke an inborn race-specific propensity for laziness and ease, an unbridled desire to meet the demands of the flesh at the expense of cultivating higher pursuits. Such behavior was deemed wholly uncharacteristic of the rational thinkers sitting atop the new racial hierarchy. And according to the revitalized humoral theory, black skin was caused by a superabundance of black bile beneath the skin. Moreover, an overflow of black bile could cause gastrointestinal disorders and weight gain. And take into consideration all of these were theories there was no like actual science so there's pseudoscience involved and um this person named 
name of the their last name is in Veray. Was it Antonio Veray or something like that? But Veray further used the language of biotheory to claim that fatness was directly correlated with skin color. Those who are darker than others of the same race are also more robust, active, and stout. The reason for this, he asserted, was that the hot sun causes the body to hold onto this excess liquid fat, allowing it to accumulate in the breast and belly. In this way, those who live with greater exposure to the sun are thus more likely to be darker skinned and are also going to experience an unslightly excess of liquid fat accruing on the body. So it made me think about like the hierarchy that colorism um also possesses because the darker you are, the more disenfranchised you are. So it gets to the how um the darker you are, the 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 more fat you are, apparently. So um let me see. It's, so I think that was it for that chapter. Mm, I think, yeah, I think that was it for that chapter. So then um, chapter four is titled Birth of the Aesthetic Aesthetic. So um, it started off with um, diet culture. So there was a um, phenomenon of weight management and... And saying like thin and slender and slender body are representation of a person who has Christian temperance. So they have more responsibilities and and intelligence within themselves. So and there's all these diets that were promoted. Like there's a milk and seed diet. Um we can we can get into like some religions that practice um certain um diets like no um seafood um no meat or something like that so it gets into like how vegetarianism there needs to be some challenging on how people um go into vegetarianism so um and a lot of a lot of people even when they go into these diets they go they still have these um disorders and sicknesses and illnesses that um go into it and there's like no science and no study on that for some reason so it's that kind of what stuck out to me in this part of the book like to think that cow's milk back then was used as a diet it's um interesting because like yeah there's like all like the way we talk about cow's milk now because it's like it's supposed to give you better it gives you vitamin d and all of that stuff when we got into like but now there a lot of plant-based milk is popular now so to think like um like dairy was was um a, substi a substitute for certain foods is interesting so it tells you like it's really never it was never really about health it's literally about um how a person a, a person's body is used and how it's perceived and then mm, there are all these standards of taste by English philosophers. So it tells you like all these analyses by these philosophers, they are not substantial because they go into, um, um, we go into um, the, the color schemes of people. There's, um, there's, they they say like they literally can just uh, make a mass a painting and say like this is the standard of beauty and everyone needs to go like this and and the entire population of people just let them and try to mimic what they consider to be the standard of beauty so it's um it's interesting and wild so let me see if it's anything else that was going on um, oh, that's it. So then chapter five is titled American Beauty, the Reign of the Slender Aesthetic. So there's this woman named Sarah Hale, who um, is a known, um, is a popular writer and journalist. Um, she writes a lot of um, 
articles involving women's beauty and etiquette. So it gets into um, how women carry their bodies too. So etiquette and beauty and temperance. So she, it also goes into um, Protestant unbeliefs on um, of diets and eating. So um, there were all these reformers that were um, pushing, um, Protestant reformers that were pushing like the supremacy of people that are of Aryan and Nordic, the Aryan and Nordic race. So that's that's Northern and Eastern Europeans. So people who are a descent of people are those. They are seen as the, the 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 ultimate beauty, while people that are Southern and I think was it Western Europe. So that's like Italians, um, Irish, um, Celtics. They're they are not seen as beautiful. So considering that's a different population of white people like i think irish people back then they were called the n-word so it goes into like there's a certain whiteness that that is the like the ultimate standard of beauty but then it's the southern and western europeans and then it's um the racial others so the so um people in africa and and um other people of color so um all of those to be all of those to be said um the Ang- the history of the Anglo-Saxon supremacy so they used uh so that there was this push on Anglo-Saxon um to be the 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 high the superior because of um they needed um a reason to um uh, secede um he- King Henry the Eighth, so it goes into like who is who should be the the royal who should be considered the the royal race, and then that get in, and then um they use Henry's um ancestry and there's the um, Anglo Saxon heritage in it, and then Thomas Jefferson, who um we all know is one of the um, founding fathers, who was also um, a plantation owner and um, raped slaves, um, he used Aryan um, Nordic supremacy to justify who should be in control of the government and all that stuff, and who should be um, deemed superior. And then Strings noted this book called The Goaties Ladies Book, which is kind of like this um, beauty ma- beauty uh, magazine. So it's this, um, it goes into more into like um, what women um, think are is beautiful, what goes into what is considered to be the person who gets all the luxuries, the the high social class and other things who gets to be rich so is this aspiration into um thinness that is being pushed in in these um in these books and and then um when we get into um how fat phobia has also um controlled the policy of immigration so as y'all team as i told y'all there's like anti-irish sentiment it's because of the the potato famine also because they um this man named thomas carlisle said the potato famine happened because the irish people don't know how to how to control themselves and they always overeat potatoes and stuff like that when it's really just the climate, the environmental conditions that led to the potato famine to be the way it is. So it never goes, it always goes into like personal responsibility and never the systemic, the social, environmental, and political context of why things are happening the way they are. Is is like, say, think about a black fat person that lives in a food desert. So that's, um, that goes into like, it's that it goes into the same playing field and that same um logic of why people are overweight and obese and fat and anything that is deemed fat and ugly. So yeah, so 
And then we go into how these beauty magazines have created. They started to become so popular that there's a market for it. So it goes into um, Harper's Bazaar, which is no, still still being published today as the magazines that are used to um, influence women into a uh, um, specifically elites, upper class, middle class, white women, what they should be eating in order to be healthy, in order to um, give birth to um, baby, because giving a birth of baby is apparently the ultimate sign of womanhood, as if there are there are women that aren't that can't give birth and don't or don't want to give birth. So it goes into. Um, um, how beauty standards have shifted and now the Venus, which is seen as the ultimate beauty during the high renaissance, is now seen as the undesirable um, standard of beauty. So, um, so all these diets were being pushed to that are, um, are trying to make people be thin and slender and... And I think, yeah, all right here. In this piece, the classical standard of beauty becomes once again the foil, reversing course on the ideal pre pre idea previously printed in Harper's that Venus was the foundation of the slender ideal. Um, I think her name is Edith Bigelow. Yeah, Bigelow's article is reminiscent of the assessment in Godey's Ladies Book that Venus would have been a little too chubby for the modern aesthetic sensibility. Of the new mode and fashion, Bigelow writes, Venus herself couldn't fashion those bodies, bodice, bodices, and if she wore stays, they would have to be made to order. If Bigelow concludes a lady wanted to be both fat and fashionable, she would have to repair not only to an earlier historical moment, but to distant parts of the world. Only in the uncivilized savage world of Africa could a big girl be prized as a beauty, and therefore a fat society lady will not be a social success unless she burnt cork herself, don beads, and then go to that burning clutch climb where women like pigs are valued at such so much a pound. So, that was published in Harper's Ma on Harper's Bazaar. So... So clearly it's something that didn't age well and goes into how whiteness and slenderness should be um, the standard. And that's it for that chapter. So, and then the next chapter, chapter six, is titled Thinness as American Exceptionalism. So it gets into more on um, Aryan Nordic supremacy and the marginalization of Jews specifically. So I'm sure, I'm sure Hitler will be fat phobic because that's one of the reasons why it led to the Holocaust because of the, the because of the um, the bigotry towards Jews and and I said earlier how um how, um the overindulgence of certain immigrants is how immigration policy became formed and it let certain immigrants in and certain immigrants uh, weren't allowed to come into the United States. And it led to the ones that are already in the United States, there was a displacement of Southern Eastern Europeans and they considered them to be hybrid whites. So there's laws against undesirable immigrants. So... That's something that I never knew um, existed. And then there was this lady named Elizabeth Bisslin, um, who, um, who was another notable um, um, writer and um, figure at the time. She described thinness as a form of American exceptionalism. It is a type of beauty possible only in the United States where the best of all races, those from Northern and Western Europe, had arrived as immigrants. These desirable immigrants had mixed and mingled to produce progeny, who were tall, thin, and of unsurpassed beauty. And she's a, a cosmopolitan contributor. So, cosmopolitan, something that's still being used today. <laughs> um, so... 
So I think I, I think I was say, I think I said it was Northern and Western Europeans. My bad. It was Northern and and um, Northern, yeah, Northern and Western Europe and um, Southern and Eastern and Southern and Eastern Europeans were considered the hybrid whites, the undesirable whites. So they're considered undesirable because of um, stoutness and fatness. And then we get into um, this person named Francis Galton who coined eugenics. So Galton's ideas about better breeding appeared in his 1883 book, Inquiries into Human Faculty and Its Development, coining the term eugenics borrowed from the Greek eugenes, meaning good and stock to describe propitious uh, mating. Galton claimed that mental and physical characteristics such as intellect and beauty were inherited. Inherited. Therefore, he claimed it made sense for only the best of the human bloodlines to breed. The goal was to give more suitable races or strains of blood the best chance of prevailing over the less suitable. So eugenics was used as a means to not only preserve um, the Anglo-Saxon races, which are the Northern and uh, Western Europeans, but also to keep them away from um, having sex and reproducing with people that are of Southern and Eastern Europeans. So, because they said that's that's the whiteness that has a little bit of black in it because of, of um, fatness. But they said people that are... Um, Within this um, standard of um, whiteness, um, they should be continuing to um, reproduce with their own and only only their own in order to preserve the Anglo-Saxon Protestant race. And then we get into um, um, the differences in beauty standards from the North and the South. Which is interesting because um, Southern beauty is there's this there's a certain fatness that's are that is allowed within Southern beauties. Like you still have um, you 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 just can't be too fat in the Southern culture, but you can have like a little bigger waist. You can have a little big breasts, but you can only have you you can't really you you're fat in the right places. That's what is going on. So, so it goes, let me see, it talks about how we are a melting pot, but only a melting pot of certain races. Because right here, um, String says, for although she, he suggests that America is exceptional as a melting pot of the races, um, Galton does not mention all the races in the brew. Preferring to name instead only the one he finds most important. The best part of her beauty will and has come from the nation of our origin, Great Britain. And the and Charles Gibson is um, a notable pa um, painter of what is co considered the Gibson girl. That's the Southern beauty. Um, String says, by the 1920s, the silhouette of the Gibson girl was not enough. Writer Perrin Stanlaws reflected on the ideal of female beauty in 1923. He outright rejected what he saw as the frequently excessive size of the real-life women inspired by Gibson's drawings. We, or at least our fathers, were all in love with the Gibson girl, with her broad shoulders and her tiny waist who weighed from 110 to 175 pounds. No, we show a most... Um, decided preference for the girl whose waistline is about 24 or 26 inches and who tips the scale at 110 to 120 pounds. The reference to the scale here is significant. Starting in 1891, public weighing scale weighing scales started to appear in shops and in busy commercial districts. By 1913, scales made their entry into private homes. For the first time in history, weight-conscious Americans could quantify their thinness and their corpulence. Many Americans were motivated by their physicians to find out their exact weight. This signaled a new front in the war on fat one that was now to be waged in the field of medicine. For although doctors since the time of George Shane have been telling corpulent people to lose weight for God, and race scientists have been urging elite white Americans to stay, stay slim for country medical science, would in the 20th century step in to tell Americans to get trimmed for health reasons. 
Yet, even in the medical field, descriptions of the relationship between weight and fat and weight and health were not motivated exclusively by medical findings. The legacy of Protestant moralism and race science as it related to fat and thin persons loomed large. Indeed, many early to mid-20th century physicians relied on moral and racial logics to rail against persons deemed too fat or too thin. thin. But over time, a growing number did so specifically and exclusively to condemn fatness. So that's how we got into like fatness as this undesirable standard of beauty to fatness as this quote-unquote sign of unhealthiness. <laughs> so that's how we started going. So that was the origin of weighing scales. It's because of um, Charles Gibson and how he um, perceives um, Southern beauty and all that. And then that's in of part two. So part three is titled Doctor's Way In. So it's just two chapters left and then I'm done. So chapter seven is titled Good Health to Uplift the Race. So this is when and we get into this man named Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. So if y'all know about Kellogg's cereal, this is the man is named after. So according, so apparently he's a entire, a whole eugenicist. <laughs> and he is, and what's interesting about him is that he has this focus on underweight women. So he um, um, studied medicine in order to get into like what influences um, a body decline and mass. So he went into um, um, the increasing encroachment of medicine and to questions of the proper diet and weight for the average American, a terrain previously dominated by race scientists and religious reformers. Rather than skirting or directly rejecting ethno-religious theories of the links between race, femininity, weight, and health, John Harvey Kellogg, a physician, eugenicist, and artist, and Christian, combined all three. And he believed that reforms to the American diet were long overdue, yet the problem was that far too many women of the fashionable classes were underweight. Invested in a form of what French philosopher Michael Foucault called biopolitics, many phys physicians in the early years of medical reform aimed to help women of the fashionable classes gain weight for their health and as a way to uplift the race. So even though he he still has this certain disdain for fatness, but he, he studies mainly on um, probably to keep, um, keep women not only... Um, a, a slenderness that is appropriate, but what is seen as healthy and and um, not underweight. So we went and Strings went into like the his history with medicine and how um, he has um, he doesn't care too much for black people, even though he was apparently cool with Sojourner Truth, but so it was interesting, but his med his studies have commercial successes and all that jazz. And he promoted certain types of diets, so vegetarian and hydropathy, which I think focuses on water. So drinking nothing but water, but I think that delves into like more of like trying to um, prohibit um, um, overindulgence in alcoholism. So I think that's why hydropathy was promoted as something that everybody should do. And he was also a seven-day Adventist. And knowing that seven-day Adventists um, during that time, they're known for like shaming um, people into, they're known for shaming people who are sick. They see sickness as something that's, a person's responsibility and not just what they had access to at the time. So they, so Kellogg had a focus on thin women. Um, and a, and Strang said here, the medical religious path Kellogg was charting was designed for the intended salvation of the human race all through the uplift of its most valuable members, Anglo-Saxons. So when he began laying out his plan for necessary improvements of humankind, Kellogg started at the top. 
The problem, he claimed, was that Anglo-Saxons were degenerating thanks to the vices of modern living, and who or what was largely to blame for this sorry state of affairs? Young, scrawny Anglo-Saxon women. These wisps risks of femininity had taken the fashion of slimness too far. Their thinness was nothing short of an epidemic and it was threatening the future of the nation. So it was interesting how we got into like all these things against fatness and there's this case on how thinness is an epidemic. So it was interesting is like, what do you want women to do, y'all? <laughs> so not only um, Kellogg's um, 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 actions uh, led to this, but also women's magazines were promoting this. But he like noted, I think what's interesting is that he noted how like people are willing to get surgeries to get thin is is unproblematic, um, which understandably so. We, but um, he also said here, related to the control of the animal appetites, Kellogg also maintained a position that if, for example, a white woman were to be so reckless as to have one child with a Negro, all of her subsequent children would be part black. Therefore, it was of utmost importance that white women breed only with white men to prevent what Kellogg called bad blood from seeping into the white race. He claimed that the hot and tot using the moniker as a synonym for blackness were blood clots blood clocks in that they had a finite amount of potential and it was implied their time on earth was running out it left to their own devices he implies african races would become extinct so he only had this care for thin white women but everyone else they're on their own like black people are going to die anyway so so he's like they're a sign of sickness so why should i study them anyway so that's him, and he also said here, Yet another issue that concerned Kellogg was the fact that from generation to generation, Americans were growing shorter and thinner. Some estimates he claimed indicated that given a sample of 5,000 to 10,000 civilized white people, they would be found to be way less in the aggregate at the present time than the same number of people weighed a generation ago. The problem, he asserted, was that public health has been too concerned with treating acute illness, whereas chronic illness have been given short shrift. As a result, defective Americans, defective that is in terms of race, ethnicity, and class, were outbreeding of people of superior stock. Consequently, he added, it is no longer the fittest alone that survives, but the feeble individual who is afforded sufficient protection. He asserted that if race degeneracy is to be arrested, the only plan of action had to be one that incorporated the new science of eugenics. Barring a consideration of the role of inheritance in disease, he concluded public health work must then inevitably tend to race depreciation. So he's going to be using um, medicine to... Um, to subjugate black people so that's kellogg's frosted flakes for you um and then he went into um the theories of slender american women and the preservation of the anglo-saxon race so it's pretty much what i've always what i always said about what he's been studying um like kellogg um, author authors were concerned about the slimness, illness, and falling childbearing rates of Anglo American girls, and what all of this signaled about the nation's health. Um, people blamed the nebulous but apparently allied forces of fashion and feminism for the trend. But while Kellogg saw slimness as evidence of the deterioration of the Anglo American blend, um. Um, another scientist inadvertently reproduces the 19th century race science found in the Cosmopolitan and other women's magazines, suggesting that slimness came naturally to young white American ladies. The American girl is an end product of a mixture of races, predominantly Anglo-Saxon, he writes. She's usually somewhat thin, often regular, angular, and not frequently, infrequently awkward. While that was certainly in good company making that point, not all medical men claimed that the slender physique was natural for Anglo-Saxon women, but well into the 20th century, a powerful contingency among them deemed it poor of, proof of poor health. So that's um, that chapter. So the last chapter of the book is titled Fat Revisited. And it started out with this person named Wendell C. Phillips and... Um, 
and how he's been using health insurance, leading health insurance companies to um, promote what's this considered normal weight. So this I didn't know. Um, you have to be a certain weight um, size in order to um, qualify for some insurance companies to be protected, knowing that the it goes into like the history of insurance and why insurance is not something that seen is not something that's been um um used in policy as something that can be implemented to be uh, the necessity for everybody in the in society but something that only certain people they have to buy or qualify for so you have to be a certain weight in order to get certain insurance companies to um be protected so he's using that he um most notably um metropolitan life which is a health insurance company um yeah, right here. In an effort to decrease risk, analysts work with insurance companies, ran the numbers, and discovered that policyholders who were considerably outside the average range of weight to height ratios represented the greatest mortality risk. And in an age in which the vast majority of salaried employees were white and male, the result was that data on working age middle class white men formed the basis of America's first normal weight tables. So all the working white men... Um, it was the standard of weight. It wasn't about health. It's literally about white men. So you can get into the BMI because that's only mirrored on what's considered a, a typical American um, size, knowing that everybody just has different body types. And then we get into um, how all these, how because of that um st that um analysis there's also um weight loss and diet books and weight management that um um lifestyles that are being promoted to white women for fertility reasons and there's this disposability of of um black people and black specifically black women cuz anyway they were considered constitutionally diseased so they weren't included into um health discussions because they were um they were seen to be disposable anyway and then we get into this person named Ansel Keys who um is the creator of the BMI which is the body mass index and and he was motivated by all these um thinkers when in regards to um sizes and weight and and um right here Spring said these statements make it hard to believe that um Key's work in this area was fueled exclusively by medical findings on the complex relationship between weight and health as opposed to his personal opinion that fat was unseemly and should be exercised in 1832 um quetzal Adolf Quetzalet had derived an index to assess weights across a given population, which became known as the Quetzalet Index. The index was not designed to measure an individual's obesity. Nevertheless, Keyes determined that his index, which he renamed the Body Mass Index, would be a useful tool for measuring obesity in contemporary societies. In 1972, Keyes published a landmark paper in the Journal of Chronic Diseases, making the case for the use of Body Mass Index, or BMI. In his own assessment, BMI was a less-than-perfect measure, but it was good enough to replace what he described as the industry hype tables. To Keyes, the BMI, if not fully satisfactory, was at least as good as any other relative weight index as an indicator of relative obesity. So he was never a person that really actually like studied diseases. He just saw how body certain body types are um, reacting to things and, and reacting to different foods and all that and to different um, medicines and how he uses this scale to... Um, to um use this as a form of social control for people that are fat and people that are of um, outside of the stand uh, outside of what is considered the standard weight and knowing the the body mass and the BMI was invented was really like used within 
these industries like in the 1980s. So it's a fairly new concept. Like it's not that long ago that this was actually implemented and, st and people starting to use the BMI, but it always shifts. So it always what's considered overweight obesity, what is considered um, uh, um, unhealthy weight, what is considered um, um what is the healthy weight for women? What is the healthy weight for men? So, but the thing is, it originated as as a study that's being used for men. So white men at that. So people that are from Europe, from Germany, from, and from the predominantly white countries. So it's, um, it's just something that's always shifting too, because it never takes in considered um, bone density of or certain body structures of people. It never takes in consideration um, the environmental um, climate of what that body has been going through, what kind of vitamins, what kind of um, genetic differences that body has. It never takes into consideration of that. It's always used this um, scale in order to see who's um, the who's who's in shape to and to preserve the anglo-saxon race so strengths also says here for a while a growing body of research indicated that the disparities in the health of health white and non-white populations were due to social and environmental factors healthy people 2000 and maintain its emphasis on individual behaviors and personal responsibility so it's been used to um just to shame people for be to having to for who has an unhealthy relationship, not only with their bodies, but an unhealthy relationship with food and feeling shame for um, eating certain types of foods. So, Strings also said here, since at least 2000, scholars have shown that one reason black people tend to have higher BMIs than whites is that black people commonly have a greater bone miner mineral density and or muscle bass than white people. By 2004, authorities such as Paul Campos, author of The Obesity Myth, Why America's Obsession with Weight is Hazardous to Your Health, has shown that while black women had higher BMIs than white women, they also had lower mortality rates at a given BMI. These and other findings have led to some scholars to conclude that there is a racial bias in the BMI classification scale. So that is where we get into... There's just so many inconsistent f findings and studies like... Um, there's a lower risk for people that are overweight, according to the BMI. There's um, elevated BMIs for Black women, but they're less likely to get diseases and stuff like that. So it shows you like it's an illegitimate, um, un an incredible thing tool to be used. So it's something that apparently doctors are still using today but it's still it doesn't do anything regarding health it only deserves into desirability in certain um, um bodies and and i think yeah, so th then that was the end of chapter eight, but then we're going into the epilogue, which goes into more into these inconsistencies. Um, String said here, the response to the new study was swift. Letters to the editors of JAMA poured in Dr. Wolfram Donor, a cardiologist at the Charity Center for Stroke Research Berlin, declared the need for a new standard of obesity to assess what, if any, relationship existed between excess fat and health. As he put it, it would be clinically useful to identify the true threshold for obesity becoming a significant mortality factor. Nor was Donor alone. A pair of physicians from the National Institutes of Health wondered whether the findings signaled a need for the medical community to shift its focus away from body weight altogether. Rather than searching for the exact amount of excess fat associated with illness and death, they suggested perhaps it was time to end the long-standing assumption that fat was bad. Uh, we also wonder, don don Dr. William Donor said here, we also wonder if it is time to simply reject the notion that being overweight or mildly obese is always bad for patients and to stop hounding such patients about their weight. If overweight patients keep their risk factors in control, they may outlive their lean friends. 
and also said here, in this way, fat phobia and a desire for slimness was about far more than empirical medical findings. They began as a way of instituting what Pierre Bourdieu called social distinctions. That is, the elites of society have used the denial of food along with social censorships, which forbid coarseness and fatness in favor of slimness, to prove the superiority of those who sit atop the social hierarchy. This analysis builds on Bourdieu's assessment by showing how historically diet and weight evolved as evidence of high class or low class standing. This book also builds on the work of Michael Foucault, Michel Foucault, who explains how the state, through the institution of medicine, uses guidelines and, and principles regarding what to eat and how much as a form of social control. As anthropologist Iwa Ong has further articulated, as it pertains to regulating individual and social bodies, modern medicine is a prime mover, defining and promoting concepts, categories, and authoritative pronouncements on hygiene, health, sexuality, life, and death. This analysis builds on the work of Foucault and other scholars, scholars by revealing the centrality of race and gender to the creation of the biopolitical rules and regulations of weight management. And that that's what this that's literally showing that fat phobia is a thing. Like it's it's goes it, it just shows like it's all pseudoscience and we just use it we just promoted it as real science and strings also said here finally however by the 20th century as described by sociologist maxine Lees craig in her artfully rendered 2002 book ain't i a beauty queen black women beauty and the politics of race black people became more vocal about the vilification of black women's appearance in a predominantly white mainstream media in the mid 20th century for instance black people began to create beauty contests specifically for black uh, for, for specifically for african African-American women as a way of instilling pride in the race. In these concepts and elsewhere in Black communities, considerable emphasis was placed on appreciating the beauty of brown skin and kinky hair. These were two of the key aesthetic move elements reclaimed in the Black as Beautiful movement, which was born in the 1960s. Conversations about the relationship between race and weight, it seems, were far less prevalent. It is worth noting that some judges and co contestants in mid-20th century pageants, as well as a few writers for magazines and newspapers during the period, did occasionally describe an appreciation for fuller figured more curvaceous women but there's a little evidence of a sustained or engagement with fat phobia as black or the slim ideal as weight until the last few decades of the 20th century this also concludes with more visible reclamations of thickness in the black community this suggests that as has been shown throughout discussions about racialized and gendered fat slender bodies circulated largely in elite white spaces and among white persons prior to the mid 20th 20th century. They served as a mechanism for white men and women to denigrate the racially othered body. They also worked to police and applaud the correct behaviors of other black, white people, especially white women. So that shows you how anti-fatness been correlating with anti-blackness. So that is um, fearing the black body. So it shows you the history of how you really should just um, appreciate your body for what it is and not let, um, not feel shame in how you're using your body. Like I know, especially during this pand pandemic, people have been ha having this hyper focus on their body, um, especially with what they've been, they've been feeding. They can't really go outside and all that stuff. But considering it's a pandemic, which it doesn't really discriminate on sizes. So it goes into how we should just really love ourselves for who we are and and like yeah if you if you feel sick go go to, go to the, go to the doctor challenge your doctor and if they say you have to be a certain way for something really look into that like do you really need to lose lose your weight or you just need medicine or uh, something to um relieve some pain so that is um, fearing the black body by um sabrina string so thank y'all for um watching this entire long video um so you got to get into like some art history into this you have to get into um, black history too and there's a lot of that academic jargon in this book so it is a tough read but it's very informative and very educational something that you probably do want to read again to like actually ingest uh, to digest but i do recommend following um 
on Instagram, Black Nutritionist, who go who dispels all these myths about um, how Black people use food. So decolonize your plate is this hashtag that she's been promoting on Instagram, which I love. She goes into more information on how the BMI is just something that's fake and should be really eradicated in the medical field. And um, be just be comfortable in the foods you eat. <laughs> um, like, yeah, eat vegetables and do something to um, help keep your body focused and when you have access to these certain types of foods. But don't feel shame for enjoying food and don't let white supremacy dictate how you should use your body. So that's it. And thank you all for um, watching this video. Um, stay tuned for another book. I'm glad I finally got back into reading again because it's been a good, <laughs> a busy couple of months for me. And um, follow my personal Instagram at Intellectual Albert and my reading list at Raising Souls. And um, I think that is it. So y'all have a good day. Um, enjoy yourselves and be gentle with yourself and with the food you eat and moving your body. So have a good day.